lost one too many and the wife okay. cut me off to buy another one. So, <laughs> so yeah, I just I thank God for my salvation and just all the you know the I was running from God, right? I knew there was a God, right? I didn't know him personally. I again lost my mom to heroin, my dad was never there. We've all had issues and stories and upbringings and all that, right? But we, some of us didn't grow up with God in our house, or, or the opposite would have been dysfunction and, you know, just craziness and uh, suicide at, the, at almost the end of it with me, but the Lord didn't allow me to go out that way. So I knew that I was in misery until I answered the call, the call of God that he had on my life. I knew someone was praying for me. That would be my grandmother in Oklahoma at the time. I got launched out there. It's a little step out there. I prayed for us and went to church for the first time. Still didn't serve God then. I didn't really have the word, but I thank God for a ministry called Victory Outreach that I ended up going in and after 19 arrests, six felonies, five misdemeanors, just in and out of jail, didn't care, didn't really know, and I'm just living a life uh, dead in my trust. I know Tesla, right? But I don't. I know of him, but I don't know him personally. So that's that personal relationship with God we have to have every day. God calls us to him and not to ourselves and not to this world. And we know we have an enemy fighting against us in the world, sin and, and flesh. But we're submitted to him. We're more than conquerors in him. Not just a conqueror, but more than a conqueror. That means you're more, he, he, he's in you now. It is no longer us who live, but Christ that lives in us. And we walk by faith in the Son of God who gave himself. It's not me who lived no more. I was just right here in the back just thanking the Lord. Lord, I couldn't even get up in front of class. I couldn't even get up and speak. But that was me in the world. But now that it's him that's in me, it's no longer me. It's him in me. So why am I going to fear now? Why am I going to fear? I used to live in fear, right? Remember I told you guys? I used to live in fear. Failed every English class just about because I couldn't get up. I was so fearful. But now he's given us faith. So we're going to be in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And this is a, I would like to say, well-known scripture. Uh, I don't hear it enough in church. I've heard it in church, but we need to hear it more. It's where the battle belongs to the Lord, right? The song and the shirt and the hat and all that. It's all the Lord's. The battle is his. So we'll start in 15 real quick and then we'll go back. Listen, or let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time. And we just pray, use me, God, as a vessel. Speak through me, God. I pray uh, that the men would hear the voice behind the voice, God, and they would apply what's being taught today, what you deposit in my spirit and what I'm experiencing, God. They would experience also, not by might nor by power, but by your precious spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> 15. And he said, listen, all of Judah and the inhabitants, inhabitants of Jerusalem and the king of Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid, right? Or do not be dismayed at this great ho horde. For the battle is not yours, but God's. The battle is God's. We we're just talking about don't, don't fear. We hear don't fear. Don't be dismayed. Don't be, right? All these different things. We hear that I think 50 to 60 times in scripture about do not be afraid because there is going to be a battle. And if you've come out of a blessing and God's given you victory, get ready for the next battle because it's, 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 our whole walk is battle and blessing and battle. We're going to go through stuff, right? So he would, he would warn us just like with uh, Joshua when Moses had died, right? Like, oh, I'm going to be taken over now. That's a lot of pressure, right? Because Moses was the man. He did a lot for the Lord. And God kept telling him, be not dismayed, be not afraid, be not. So I have to be reminded of that all the time. We're going to go back to verse 1. So a little uh, background, uh, verse 19, and, 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 and uh, Jeho Jehoshaphat was, was still uh, doing things with uh, King Ahab at the time, right? He was a godly king, but yet... Other kings of the north in Israel were, a lot of them were wicked. Ahab on down, Ahab, Jezebel, the whole nine, right? So he still had the world in his eyes, almost like Lot, right? Or Lot's wife, I'm sorry. Remember when he said, don't turn around or you'll be a pillar of salt. And, and the world was still in her eyes. Something of the world still caught her attention. 
just like uh, Jehoshaphat's, uh, uh, <clears throat> just like the king of Ahab and, and Jehoshaphat, uh, kings and, and one wicked, one righteous. But uh, that, a little background. So, so God's people were uh, coming into this land and, you know, these armies were coming against them and all that. We're going to get into that. And he does the righteous thing because he's a righteous king, right? He seeks the Lord and all that. So let's get into it. Uh, chapter 20, verse 1. After the Moabites and the Ammonites, and with them some of the Mennonites came against Jehoshaphat in the, in the battle. And I think that's the Adamites or Adamites. There's so many mites, right? Parasites and ites and ites, you know, just everything, right? But all these were coming against <clears throat> Jehoshaphat for the battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat a great multitude is coming against you from Edom. And that's Edomites right there. Or Edom's the place, I'm sorry. From beyond the, the sea and behold, there is Hezon Tamar that is En Gedi, En Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah and Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord and from all the cities of Judah came to seek the Lord. So basically as they're coming away from, I believe it was the Red Sea or the Dead Sea, one of the seas over there, and they're coming over this look. It almost was like the Grand Canyon. They were looking down on like these armies, you know, to, to get into the background to that too. So <clears throat> Jehoshaphat set his face, seek the Lord, right? Proclaimed a fast. So he did what was right. He knew, hey, these armies that are coming against me, right? These things that in life that are coming against us and battles that, that we're like, oh, it's too big, it's too... Let me seek the face of God. And the first thing you want to do is pray, of course, right? But to fast and pray, that's a double whammy right there. That, that means you're getting God's attention. Like, God, I need your help. I need you to come and help me. I need you to do what you got to do in my life. So that's why he was a righteous king still, though he had faults and, and all that. But again, we've seen him seek the face of God. We've seen him proclaim a fast. Verse 5, And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem, and in the house of the Lord before the new court, and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God in heaven? Are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms and the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand against you. So he reminded God, God, aren't you the God of everything? Aren't you the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Aren't you the God? And that's what we need to do. We need to remind God of who he is, how holy and how powerful and how we can't win this battle. It's only the Lord that can pull us through it, right? So he was just bringing remembrance of how good God is. And, and even a prayer at one time where God has answered a prayer, right, in your life. And you've seen the faithfulness of God in your life. And you've seen what God has done. So you're just reminded God. God, remember that last prayer when you pulled me out of the pit, when I went through this, when I went through that? You came through. You're not going to leave me nor forsake me now. Right? The battle is his. He's going he's gonna to win it every time. But it's when we're in fear and when we don't go to the Lord and when we want to do it in our own strength. The enemy wants us to do it in our own strength. So you could get defeated now and discouraged and now come against God and say, why didn't you help me and all this when it was on our own, own understanding, yeah. leaning on our own understanding. No, we need him. We need to remind him. God, you did it before. Do it again. It reminds me of a story when I worked at a car wash over here when Bear Creek Car Wash first started. We would get all these, I was detailing right there and all that, but we would get all these nice cars for Bear Creek coming down. And, and I had a little cheap little cell phone at the time, right? One of my first jobs out of Victory Outreach. And, and I had these shorts on I shouldn't have been wearing because the, uh, the phone fell out in someone's car. And I go, oh, man, I'm in trouble now. I need my phone. Like, so I started praying on it. Then the next day, they brought the phone back. So like two or three days later, uh, my buddy who I was, uh, I met some guys that worked there, and they lived in Hemet. So we all carpooled together from Hemet to work and all that. His brother worked in the Jiffy Lube right there. And then uh, we were working at the car wash and all that. So, <clears throat> so he gave, gave me his key one time to his car. He had a little Chevy Cobalt. And it had uh, the little, you know, the, it wasn't just any key. It was one of those like special keys where, yeah, the chip in it exactly. You had to sp sp pay extra money. So, so I was, had those same shorts on and the, and the key fell. And like right after work, 
is when I realize, I go, oh, man, we're screwed. Like, I, I dropped the key in someone's car, and oh, that's a $400 key. And, and I just reminded God yet again, God, you brought my cell phone back. You can bring this key back. Well, lo and behold, a day later or whatever, so they, they, it's not like you're going to go looking down there like someone dropped a key or unless you see it, right? But they had dro- the person had dropped something down there, so they were reaching down there, and, and the key was just by itself. It wasn't on a, on a lanyard or any of that, you know, so that's God's faithfulness. I was just reminding, I actually got it from here, but, you know, I reminded God of his faithfulness and what he did it before, and And he came through. I didn't have to pay the guy $400, and I didn't have $400 as it was. So Uh, praise God. Uh, Let's go to uh, 7, I believe it is. Did you not give? Sorry. Did you not? Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of the land before you people of Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham? Your friend reminded God of of what he did before, eight. And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you for your name is in the house, and we cry out to you for our affliction, and you will hear and save. So right there in Solomon's temple, I believe Solomon had a prayer when he built the temple of things were to happen. I'm kind of paraphrasing. I don't have the chapter and verse. But he had had a prayer like that where, where Jehoshaphat had read from that and cried out too, right? So not only fast and praying, but crying out, reminded God of his, his faithfulness, his goodness. Uh, and to save. God, save me. That's what Hosanna means. It means save now. You didn't have to say anything but Hosanna. Hosanna, save me now. Help me, God. I need your help. Sometimes it's more urgent than others, but God, save me, and he's going to come through, right? Every time. Has he came through every time? Maybe sometime it took longer. It took for us to wait and all that. God was working it out, right? He couldn't just, he could, of course, but he was just working things out. And then, boom, there he was rescuing us, grabbing us from the lion's mouth, as Scripture says. Verse 10, And now, behold, the men of Ammon and Moabite and Mount Suri, or the Edomites, these are the armies basically coming against uh, God's people, right? Whom you would not let Israel invade when they came up from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy. Behold, verse 11, they they rewarded us by coming to drive us out, drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit, right? This is our land, you know? Oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde and coming, coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Again, we do not know what to do. Again, the enemy, he, he comes crafty, right? He sends this and sends that, and maybe possible divorce on the, on the horizon, maybe possible to, to get us to fear, to get us not to trust God, to get us what? To abandon ship, to test us in our faith, to do this, to do that. But yet they kept reminding themselves, our eyes are fixed on you. And if you've never put your eyes fixed on him to win that battle, you're not really going to know. But if you have, like many of us have, we're going to know his faithfulness. We're going to know he's going to come through. We're going to know that, hey, it's not, it's not moping and crying in the event. It's you're conforming me into the image of your son. You're making me more holy. You're making me more. You're, he's doing something in us, right? God, I want to love people. Okay, let me put you around people you can't stand. Okay, God. You know, because we can love who we love, but if we start being around people we can't stand, then our love's going to be tested and it's going to be sharpened. And eventually we will have that love that Christ talks about where he said, love your enemies. Love those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Matthew uh, 544, I believe it is. We'll have that. But again, have our eyes fixed on God. Right? They cried out in their affliction, right? Save us, help us. I remember when I cried out, 19 arrests later, six felonies, right in the county jail. 
And finally, I was reading a Dr. Charles Stanley uh, in Touch magazine. I know I probably said it or you guys heard it in preachings or videos. Before. Wayne probably has because he's, he's heard me preach before. But uh, into the magazine, it's talking about the armor of God. I go to church two days later. They're talking about the armor of God. I go, well, maybe it's a coincidence. So I go back to my cell and me and my celly get into it or whatever. They remove him and... I get the cell to myself for a season or whatever, but I went back to church. Another church came through and they were talking about the armor of God. So I said, okay, this has got to be God. He's got to be telling me something. He's now showing me multiple times. And I remember crying out after I got my county lit. I did eight months in jail and practically three and a half years of victory outreach after that. But I was crying out, thank you, God. Thank you. I'm done with myself. I can't do it no more. You take the will. I'll go through whatever I need to go through. They told me to go to Victory Outreach multiple times. I got out. I'm sorry, God, get me out, only to do it again, right? Only to do it again. And finally, when I repented and was sorry, now I had to do that whole eight months in jail. Now I had to go through, now I had to go through the tough part of it, but that's who built, uh, he built who I am. So, so in that affliction, they cried out, just like many of us. We have many testimonies, right? We have many Either it's a testimony or it's a testifony, they say, right? So we want it to be a testimony before God, right? I threw that in for Winger because he was, he was falling asleep over there. <laughs> and now behold, the men of Ammon and Moabite and Mount Suri, whom, verse 10, whom you would not let Israel invade when they had come from the land of Egypt and whom they avoided and did not destroy. Verse 11, behold, the reward... I think I might have read this. Us by coming to drive out. Okay, drive that. Let's go 12. Our God, will you not execute judgment? Read that. Sorry, 13, 13. Meanwhile, all of Judah stood before the Lord with all their little ones and their wives and their children. And the spirit of the Lord came upon Je Je Jehezel. He was uh, the prophet back then that we'll hear more about. Uh, and the son of, he's the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah. I don't know if that's that same Benaniah that was uh, David's, uh, one of his warriors, right? Benaniah, like his armor bearers. Uh, son of Giel, son of Mathena, Mathena, and a Levite and the sons of Asa in the midst of the assembly. And he said, listen, so now the word of the Lord came. Now they fasted, they prayed, they cried out of their affliction, all these different things. And then God sent the prophet of the Lord to speak to them. Now what we have nowadays is, is we have, Lord uses people to speak right on behalf. Doesn't mean they're prophets and all that, but he has, we have his word. But back then they would send the prophet and they would send the, you know, all that. But God will use anything to show us what to do next, right? What are we going to do next? That, that, that's, what, that's what they're going to do. And he said, listen, all of Judah, 15 inhabitants of Jerusalem and the king Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed, right? We read that word. That's the, the famous verse in here. For the battle is not yours, but it's God. Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, right? So he's saying exactly what's going to happen, right? And you will find them at the end of the valley east of the wilderness of Jerel. You will not need to fight again. He's letting them know. You will not need to fight this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on behalf of, oh, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid, right? He's letting them know, don't be afraid. Just to, here's your marching orders. You need to just stand firm and hold your position. Kind of reminds me of the, the, word, or the armor of God, right? At the end of it, stand firm, right? Everything else is offensive. You're getting hit, you're getting hit. And, and the sword would be the offensive weapon, which is the word of God that we come against the enemy with, right? Or any, anything against, but stand firm. And he says, withstand. In, in, in all your stand, hold fast. J -j Just stand and wait on the Lord, right? That's powerful right there. I didn't even see that at first. Okay, so verse, you will not need a fight. Verse 18, then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before him and worshiped the Lord. So they, they literally just bowed their, 
Now, again, it's one thing to be on a knee, right? It's one thing to, but to be on your face before God, you're a holy God, like there's nothing in me. And everyone did it. It was, it was a corporate assembly of them humbling themselves before the Lord because time was coming, right? It was getting closer to them armies and this. As the time gets closer, we need God more, you know? So he had to, he had to, he had to cry out more and, and humble himself more. Powerful, powerful, just, just these principles in here of, of what he did. We learn a lot from that, from, from good, bad, and ugly, right? We learn from even the wicked kings. I go, why there's so many wicked kings? Well, that's for us not, not to do what they did, you know, not, to, not to, do, to, to seek God and to have God, you know, not to turn from God. Then Jehoshaphat, okay, we read that, uh, 20, verse 20, 19, I'm sorry. And the Levites and the... How do you say that? Co- Koahites? Koratites? I need to take a, a lesson on these Old Testament words, you know. Stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. And they rose early in the morning and went out in the wilderness of Tekoka. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established, right? Believe in his prophets and you will succeed. 21, and when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and to praise him in his holy attire. And they went out, bef- and they went out before the army and saying, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. Now, it didn't make sense at first, right? Okay, this is a battle. I'm sending out my Davids and my mighty men of armor and warriors and this and that, right? It, it didn't make sense. But God said, hey, look, I do things different. You're going to put all your worship in people, and as you worship, and we're going we're gonna to read on, the armies are going to, you know. And the same thing, watch this, with the enemy. When you start to worship, remember, the enemy was the worshiping angel, right? Lucifer, right? I don't have time to get into all of that, but we get to worship now. He doesn't. So one of the greatest weapons next to the Word of God in prayer and fasting is worship. And I'm not talking just some basic worship in church, and I'm just... No, when you have the gift of worship on you and you know how to work, I don't know if you guys seen, I wasn't doing it to park like that for you to see me, but I was in there just getting it before I came in, just worshiping. And you got to be a worshiper because that's going to turn the enemy from you. He'll get far from you because he was the, was the worshiping angel, right? So worship is a powerful weapon. I, it, I can't stress it enough because we don't, we don't hear it like that, but we just think, oh yeah, we're going to be worshiping God forever. No, that's a, that's a weapon right there. Right, so he said, set up your worship and angels. Now, again, he seek the face of God. He humbled himself. The prophet came. The prophet said, hey, do this. Because, again, the prophet or someone with the relationship with God that's been there, done that, is going to say, hey, don't do it like that. Don't do what Dr. Phil says. <laughs> don't do this. Don't do that if you're going to get divorced. Do it like this. Do it God's way. Worship your way through the storm. Worship your way. I always tell people that that are going through it. Learn how to worship. Worship your way through it. And I don't mean get nutty and Bethel and Jesus culture and all that. I'm just saying learn how to worship. Because he's inhabited by the praises of what? His people. And what's the opposite of worship? Complaining. Don't complain. Then you're bringing in your praises to the wrong, the wrong God, right? The enemy himself. Get into worship. Get into thanksgiving. Get into that. So let's keep going. We're almost done <laughs> I might be all day, but my wife has work, so. (laughs) And when they began to sing praises, 22, and the Lord set ambushes, there it is, against the men of Ammon and Moabite and Mount Syria, and those who came against Judah, so that they were routed. Anyone got another version? Destroyed or? Okay, Uh, 23. For the men of Ammon and Moabite against inhabitants and Mount Syria, devote in them to destruction and them that had made the end of the inhabitants of Syria and they all helped to destroy one another. There it is. Now I was hearing a Chuck Smith. I don't know if you guys ever go on YouTube and you're like Chuck Smith, uh, this chapter and verse, or he's got plenty of videos. He's got plenty of stuff. Uh, and I was hearing a message just on it to get some more history on it. Cause he, he did a deep study obviously on it. Deeper study than I, 
I have, I don't know all the different lands and different this and different that. So he was talking about how one time uh, one of the police officers in his congregation was telling him about how two, uh, these cops were pulling over these guys, these bikers. They started pulling them out of the car and there was alcohol and, and all six of the cops started like attacking the two cops, right? And, and, and the cops were believers and all that and, and, and one of them was praying and, and whatever. But then uh, like the ambush where it says that they destroyed themselves, these, uh, these bikers ended up turning on themselves and started brawling with each other. And then the cops are sitting back like, well, did you get hit? Did you get a scratch on you? Did you get hurt? No, no, I didn't. So he was telling that story of what happened here. So again, as they begin to worship, as they begin to do what God said and, 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 and listen to what God said by humbling themselves, they didn't even have to fight the battle. Come on now, right? They destroyed themselves. And then we're going to read on how God's people go in and collect the spoils and all that. You know, but again, worship is very, very key. Whatever battle's coming against you, whatever enemy, whatever, whatever uh, someone being used by the enemy, you start worshiping, praying and all that, and, and God's going to turn it around on them. And again, like I said, the enemy has to get away from you now, right? Because the battle is the Lord's. We're on 24, 24, when Judah... We'll skim through this. When Judah, Judah came, I got a couple more minutes, five, ten more minutes, I don't. Okay, cool, we're good. Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness. They looked towards the horde, and behold, there were dead bodies lying on the ground. None had escaped. Praise God. There it is. They didn't have to fight one of them, right? Not even kick one that was dying. You know, just when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take the spoil. They found among them in great numbers goods, clothing, precious things that they took themselves until they could not carry no more. They were three days taking the spoil, and it was so much. So again, they came in, they collected the spoil, didn't even have to fight the battle, got blessed. Got blessed with so much stuff, it took them three days to finally, you know, we know that's a, a number of God, two, three, and... 10, 40, you know, these biblical numbers. On the fourth day, they assembled, 12 also, the Valley of Baraka, which means blessing is what they named it. And they ended up naming it later on after Jehoshaphat. For they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of the place we called the Valley of Baraka to this day. Then they returned every man of Judah. Sorry. Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat at their head, returning to Jerusalem with joy for the Lord. So they were excited, right? You win a battle, you're joyful. God has delivered me. God has won the battle for me. God has came through. God, you're going to be joyful, right? You're not going to be depressed. I hope not. Then they had made them rejoice over their enemies. And they came to Jerusalem with harps and lyres and trumpets. I mean, they put on a worship show. I, I wish I was there, you know to the house of the Lord, and the fear of God came on all the kingdoms of the countries that had heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet. His God gave him rest all around. We'll stop right there. So, right, they, ultimately, everyone had heard about it, right, because the word gets out, good, bad, and ugly but that the Lord had won it, the Lord. So I guarantee you, like even these people that turned away from God and they would, the Bible says high places, right? They would serve Baal and all these different Molech and all these different gods. And they turned from that and seen the battle of the Lord. They seen the Lord come through yet again because sometimes he has to remind us. Or am I the only one? Sometimes I get comfortable and, and thinking I'm saved and thinking I'm good and thinking I'm, no, we got to keep our guard up, you know? So the key for today is worship, you know? Worship your way through it. Trust in the Lord. Uh, humble yourself fast. Pray. That these are all fundamental key things we got to know. And the th these are the quivers and the, and the, 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 the arrows in the quiver, right? These are what's going to help us, right? Not complaining, not uh, lying, not uh, gossiping, not all these works of the flesh aren't going to help us. We got to stay in the spirit. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. God bless us with your word. Thank you for who you are, God, that you are the God that wins every battle. God, you've never lost a battle, God. And we just, we know, God, that we do have battles. We go through 
uh, things in life and people pass in and people wronging us and people, but we put our trust in you, God, that you reward us, God. You will give unto us. We know the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can know it? You said you test the heart and test the mind to give to every man according to his works, according to his deeds. So as we work into you, God, you would bless us. You would meet the need in our lives, God. We don't work for salvation. We work as a byproduct of salvation to reach those out there. So I pray for those out there that are lost, God, that are put them in our path, God, that we would give them a word, God, in due season, God. We would share the word, God, share the light with them that God can save them. God loves them no matter what they have done. We pray for lost loved ones, God, those that don't want to hear it, those that are stubborn and stiff-necked and stuck in their ways for years, God, break the chains on their hearts, on their lives, God, that you would bring the light of the gospel to their lives and you would restore and redeem everything, God, as the lost locust with the what the locusts have eaten, God, you would redeem it and restore it. We're forever grateful in Jesus' name, amen.